Most people are familiar with the story of David. We see him throughout history in music, literature, and art. David is this amazing hero, an elegant poet. He's a man to be admired, conquering giants, capable in the wilderness, able to fight off lions and bears. He's the quintessential man's man. Who wouldn't want to be King David? And he seems to have this impossibly close relationship with God, the kind of relationship that only an iconic Bible character could have. But when you look closer, you see his flaws on display, a man with hidden secrets caused by his own selfish desires. And despite the years in between our lifetimes, his story starts to look a lot like our own. The truth is, in many ways, the story of David is the story of all of us, a perfect God loving an imperfect person. This summer, we study victory, failure, betrayal, tragedy, and worship in our series, David, After God's Heart. Well, hey, good morning. This is our time in our worship of God where we set apart a pretty good chunk of our 75 minutes to spend studying God's Word together. It's the time when our church, meeting in Carbondale and Marion, come together because we know that when we study God's Word, we are discovering God's best for us that He made possible through Jesus. Because of that, the Bible is full of words of encouragement and hope and an invitation from God to experience life in Christ. And the Bible is also filled with warnings and um, invitations out of brokenness and sin. Sometimes the messages seem really encouraging when you read, and sometimes they seem really stern and, and, well, difficult. And as we take a look together in God's Word today, you're going to kind of sense that, that difficulty, that heaviness, that weight. Um, If you're new with us, um, this one's not going to be one of those cheery talks. And if you were here last week, you know why. All summer we've been studying the life of David and we said from the beginning, hey, David isn't perfect, but man, he was the guy who showed showed us what it looks like to pursue God. I mean, he was all in, the man after God's heart. Except this one time. There was one event in the life of David that David did not pursue God at all. It was in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. As we saw last week, David sent Uriah along with his entire military force, numbering about 1.3 million soldiers against the Ammonites who had sought to attack Israel. But instead of David doing what kings do in leading that military force, David stayed back, sending Uriah and the men out. Well, while Uriah was out serving with all the other faithful soldiers, David got a look at his wife, who was bathing, and he lusted over her. And then when he asked his people, his servants, his crew, like, who is that? They warned him by saying, isn't that Uriah's wife? But instead of stopping David continued in his lust by having her brought to his home where they committed adultery. When she, a few weeks later, sent word back to David that she had conceived a child out of their adulterous relationship, David went into um, a pretty elaborate scheme to cover up his sin. He had Uriah brought home from the battlefield and tried to get him to go home to make it look like it was his kid Uriah refuses to do that while being faithful to his brothers in arm out on on the battlefield. And so David was left with a mess. No way to make it look like this was Uriah's kid. And so David went deeper into his sin, sent a note back with Uriah to the commander, Joab, that said, hey, take Uriah all the way to the front and then pull back from him so he will be killed. This whole mess of David not being where he was supposed to be, which was out serving God, leading the men, ended up in lust, adultery, deception, and cold-blooded murder. We pick up right where we left off last week. Uriah is dead, 
And word has been sent back to David and then to Bathsheba that he is dead. Bathsheba entered into the cultural standard of what was probably about 30 days of mourning. And then we pick up the story in the last verse of chapter 11. Look, look at this one. When the morning was over, so about 30 days, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore his son. But the thing that David did displeased the Lord. <laughs> I want to read that verse and go, you think? Holy smokes. I mean, here's the guy who for his entire life had been pursuing God. Not pulling it off perfectly, but perfectly pursuing God. And here is a man who has now stooped so low that he's had a man killed so he can have his wife and then they have a kid together. And now months later, he is cold hearted. David doesn't even care. He's kind of like, huh, got that taken care of. Let's just go on and act like nothing ever happened wrong. We're just going to act like a regular old married couple who now have a, a kid together. But God wasn't done. God wasn't done. You see, when we are taking a look at this story, there's one question that ought to come to our mind. How does a man like this get out of a mess like that? How does a man who has stooped so low to murder another dude to steal his young bride get out of that place? Because when you've been so cold toward God, when you have been unwilling to repent all along the way, like how do you get out of that mess? And this is a really important question because some of us have a friend in our lives. And right now we've been asking that question, man, how's my friend ever get out of that? Because she's gone a long way. And let's be straight. Some of us, though our story isn't exactly like David's, we kind of wonder the same thing. Like, after I did that, how do I get out of that hole and be a person who pursues God again? Because I kind of have a rap sheet. I kind of have a history. I keep getting reminded of what I did when I strayed from God. How do I, how do I ever get out of that? So today, we answer that question. So go ahead and join me if you have your Bible or your Bible app. We're headed to 2 Samuel chapter 12. We're going to go ahead and continue our story, picking up right at the beginning of chapter 12. And as you are finding your way to 2 Samuel chapter 12, here's the first line of verse 1. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. If, if you were here last week, remember how we looked at at the ways in which God kept saying to David, stop, come out, don't do it. Allow me to protect you. God's first protection was giving David a ministry. He was the king. He was supposed to lead the military forces of Israel. Had he been doing that, he would have been protected from sin. He would not have allowed himself to, to be in a vulnerable place. But God again reached out to David after he lusted over Bathsheba when he asked about her and the servant said, isn't that the wife of Uriah? God was saying, stop. Don't go any further. See her as a person, not an object. Stop the sin. But again, David refused and continued careening down that hill. And then God sent Uriah. And when David was scheming to make it look like it was Uriah's kid, Uriah had integrity. Uriah was showing David what David looked like back in the day when he was pursuing God. And God was again saying to David, stop. Remember the man you used to be. Remember the man in the cave where you refused to do that which was evil because you cared most about me. And each time God said, stop. Take the exit ramp. Come back to me. But David went all the way to the bottom. 
of being a murderer. Not just Uriah got killed, but other soldiers were lost when Joab pulled his forces back so that Uriah would be killed. Multiple people have died because of David's sin. But here's what's so important about verse 1. God still pursued David. He still wanted him. And there are some of you that that's the message you needed to hear from God's word today. No matter where you've been, no matter who you were with, how long you strayed, no matter what people see when they look at you, God is still pursuing you. He still wants you. No matter how many times you turned your back on Him, no matter how many times you said, I don't care, no matter how many times you flipped God the bird by the way your life displayed your allegiances, God's still pursuing you. And you know it. You can feel it. God pursued David. And he sent to David the prophet Nathan. He was the perfect person to go talk to David. He was the prophet. He was the one God spoke through when he talked to his people. He was revered by God's people and feared by God's people. Because he spoke the truth. David sought Nathan for advice when he wanted to know God's will. And he respected Nathan in a big way. Nathan was also a good friend to David. Nathan was the kind of guy who would tell the king the truth. um, Sometimes when nobody else would. There was one occasion when David said to Nathan, Hey, I want to build the temple. And Nathan's like, Dude, high five. You're pursuing God. Go for it. But then God revealed to Nathan that David wouldn't build the temple to be Solomon. And Nathan had to go back and tell David the truth, which he did. So they had some relational equity. They had a friendship. They had trust. God sent Nathan to David. But this was no easy message to deliver. This wasn't even as easy as saying, hey, David, you're not going to build the temple. This was a hole that David had dug so deeply That he couldn't even see his own sin. Like he's in denial. And so, God gave Nathan a story. We would call it a parable. It's a real simple parable. Three and a half verses. Chapter 12, verse 1 to 4. That's it. Really simple. Two characters. A rich man who had many flocks and herds. Very many flocks and herds. And then a poor man who had one animal to his name. This one little ewe lamb he purchased, um, probably with his last pennies. And he raised this little ewe lamb with his kids. This little ewe lamb ate morsels out of his hand, um, snuggled in his arms, and it was like a child to him. And all you animal lovers here are like, oh, I'm thinking of. And you're, and you're all of a sudden wondering, will my animal be in heaven? I mean, we have, we have such affinity of those animals that God has placed in our lives. Like, we want it to last. The rich man had a traveler show up. And back then, you were expected to house a traveler. Hospitality was required. And so when the traveler showed up, the rich man looked at his many flocks and herds and said, I ain't killing none of my animals to give to this dude. So he demanded that the poor man give up his one ewe lamb. And he killed that ewe lamb and fixed a meal for his traveler, meeting the needs of his hospitality. So Nathan's telling this story. And here's what you got to understand. David does not think this is a parable. And I'll prove it here in a second. David does not think this is a parable. He thinks this is a real life story. And it's right that David would have thought that. You see, he's the king. He's the monarch. You see, we are accustomed to the kind of division of power. There was no division of power in David's day. He was the power. Uh, He made the laws. Think legislative branch. He carried out the laws, think executive branch, and he interpreted the laws, think judicial branch. 
So he was accustomed to people coming to him and saying, hey, David, what do you say about this situation? So Nathan tells him this story about the rich guy who took the one lamb from the poor guy. And look at verse 5. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. I mean, David is ticked off. He is furious with this rich man who stole the one lamb from the poor dude. He is furious. This is no parable to David. This is what angered him intensely. But let's think about what happens there. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives. So so it's this, you know, with God as my witness. It's that kind of thing. The man who has done this deserves to die. That's interesting. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Now think about what David says. This is really telling. Number one, David rightly cites the law. If you read Exodus 22, you will find that if you steal a guy's ox, you owe him five in replacement. If you steal a guy's sheep, you owe him four in replacement. David knows the law. He knows that when a sheep is stolen, it's fourfold restoration. Isn't it interesting how David knew the law for others, but not for himself? And then look look at the first phrase, where David said, that man deserves to die. No, he didn't. Um, You can't replace a family pet. You just can't do it. Um, What the law said is, you owe the guy four. As evil and as nasty and as selfish as it was, you owe him four lambs. You know who did deserve to die? That'd be David. David 2x and Bathsheba 1. You see, because of adultery, the Old Testament law declared that David and Bathsheba were both deserving of death for their sin. David was doubly deserving of death for his sin because of the cold-blooded murder of Uriah. Isn't it interesting how it's much easier to see the sin of another than to see your own? It's no wonder Jesus says, hey, get the big old plank out of your eye before you go digging somebody else's speck out. David said, he deserves to die. But in reality, David was the one who deserved to die. And now, God had David's attention. It's plausible, quite likely, that this whole sin of David has now been going on for a year. Just the natural reading of this story, Uriah dies, Bathsheba mourns, David brings her home, makes her his wife, and they have a child. Total of 10 months gestation, maybe a little time after that. It's been like a year. Likely been a year when Nathan comes to David. It's likely been a year that David's thought, I'm good. I'm good. It's likely been a year that David has not heard from God. His heart is cold. He's in a really dark place. But now, God has his attention. Because David believes that that man deserves to die. Which makes verse 7 really powerful. Nathan said to David, You are the man. Now today, we kind of like that phrase. Oh, you the man! You the man! That's not how this one was going down. When David said, that man deserves to die, Nathan said, you are the man who deserves to die. And then through Nathan, God tells him why. In verse 7 and 8, God says to David, I picked You, I anointed you king, remember, 
when he was like 10 years old. I picked you, son of Jesse, from nowhere. You didn't deserve to be king. I picked you. I anointed you king. I protected you from Saul. All those years that he tried to kill you, he threw spears at you, he hunted you down. I protected you. I delivered you. And then when he was dead, I gave you everything. You had inherited everything that came with his household, all of his wealth, all of his holdings. I gave it all to you. And man, if that weren't enough, I would have given you that much again. You know what you did? You son of Jesse? Do you know how you responded to my generosity to you, oh rich man? You despised me. You despised my word. And you went out and killed a man to take his wife, his young bride, his only treasured possession, which he which he thought of almost like a daughter. She was so precious to him. And you went out and had him killed to take his wife. You had it all. I would have given you more and you treated me like that. And God says to Nathan, or excuse me, through Nathan to David, it's about to get really bad. Because you have have so sinned against me. Um, The sword's not going to be removed from your household. It's about to get bloody, my friend. Uh, I'm going to raise up evil against you. We'll come back and talk about that. And um, what you tried to do in secret, I'm going to bring it out in broad daylight. David Guzik explains how um, this consequence of sin, God's judgment of David plays out specifically in four sons. Son number one would be the child that he and Bathsheba conceived in adultery. God afflicts him and that baby dies. Child number two is a grown son named Amnon. And what we see in Amnon is that David sends go to the next generation, Amnon rapes his half-sister, Tamar. Tamar's full brother, Absalom, avenges his sister's rape by killing Amnon. Absalom, then a fugitive, runs from the country, and interestingly, David says nothing and does nothing about any of it. His sins are playing out in his kids. Finally, Absalom is allowed to come back into the country, but when he comes back, he leads a rebellion and ultimately runs David out of the country and takes over the throne. And in a battle between Absalom and David, many, many people die, including Absalom, and David regains his throne. But then just before David dies, Adonijah tries to grab the throne. What a bloody, horrible mess. And when God says, I'm going to raise up evil against you, David, some of us kind of flinch. We're like, what? What? When the Bible says God's going to raise up evil, don't think of that last um, movie you watched um, where innocent people were put under some sort of spell and they were doing things against their will. No, the Bible is very clear in James 1. God is not tempted by sin, nor does he tempt people to sin. He didn't put anybody under a spell. What we see in Romans 1 is that when people sin... God is giving them over to their own desires. He's saying, okay, have it your way. And it gets ugly fast. David's sin is played out in the desires of his kids. And he does not help check them in it. And it goes really bad really fast. 
God gives them over. And some of you have wondered, I'm in a mess, and the consequences of my sin are all around me. I see them every day. Or you've wondered this for a friend, and you've thought, how does forgiveness even work in a case like this? God reveals that to us through Nathan's interaction with David. When Nathan tells David about the consequences of his sins, David responds in a beautiful way. We see in the next verse, verse 13, that David says, I have sinned. I've sinned against the Lord. It's been a year. And finally, David repents. Finally, David stops Finally, David takes the exit ramp from this nasty path of careening headlong into destruction. Finally, he exits. He says, I've sinned against the Lord. There's something really important in that phrase. Yes, David had sinned against Bathsheba. He lusted over her and had her brought to his house. Yes, David sinned against Uriah. He had the dude killed. Yes, David sinned against all of Israel, violating the trust of God's people of their king. But ultimately, David sinned against God. The one who had given him all of this, the one who had chosen him, the one who had anointed him, the one who had been generous with him. David, by his actions, had reviled God. And now in his repentance, he realized, oh, I've sinned against the Lord. As we'll hear later in Psalm 51, this psalm of repentance, David says, O Lord, against you and you alone I have sinned. Ultimately, our sin is against our divine, holy, righteous, and loving creator who has revealed himself to us. I mean, think about just yesterday, the gorgeous day that we experienced and the awesome opportunity to look up and say, Wow, this is beautiful. This is awesome. All of us are without excuse because God has revealed himself in in the beauty of creation. You can look at it and know there is a divine. And even though we know there is the divine, we regularly go our own way. And we say, "Ah, I don't want you. Our sin is against our God. Our sin is against the God who so loved us that he sent his son. And in the second half of this verse, David hears a prophecy about the coming of Jesus in a really dramatic way. This this is amazing. Verse 13, David says, I have sinned against the Lord. The prophet Nathan responds with, the Lord also has put away your sin you shall not die. The one who was deserving of death, according to the law, would not die. And Nathan said, David, God has put away your sin. Now, here's where we have a huge benefit. You see, we are reading this story from about 3,000 years later, able to look back and see what God did. What we are able to see is that when Nathan referred to the putting away of David's sin, he was referring to God putting his sin on Jesus. Okay, here's how it plays out. In Romans 3, the Bible tells us that we are all guilty. None of us are righteous. We have all sinned and we are deserving of death. It was true of the people in the Bible, the Old Testament. It's true of us today. What gets really interesting about this story is that for the people in the Old Testament, before Jesus came, God was storing up the punishment for their sins. Remember that last superhero movie you watched? 
and like the superhero is absorbing the attack. Maybe it was a firebolt or something like that. And you see that superhero just absorbing the wrath of his enemy. And then finally, that superhero goes whoosh and shoves it back. This is the story of the Old Testament. God in his forbearance, is the technical word, is storing up the wrath do his people for their sins. And when Jesus stretched out his arms on the cross, whew, Jesus took the wrath for all of that sin. Nathan said to David, God has put away your sin. And now we have seen Jesus take it. For David... And for us, Jesus went through hell so you don't have to. Jesus took the wrath of God so you don't have to. The next time that somebody asks you, how can a loving God send people to hell? Respond by this. How can a just God overlook sin? He didn't. He did not overlook David's sin. He has not overlooked your sin. He stored it up. And Jesus paid it all. He settled the debt that you and I could never, ever pay. And in that moment, God declared David forgiven. He repented. He came back to God. And God willingly, lovingly, with arms open wide said, you'll not pay for that, I will. Got you covered. But there's one last part to the story. And this is really important for us because some of us right now are confused about this part of forgiveness and consequences of sin. Look at the last couple verses, 14 and 15. Nevertheless, so remember, you're forgiven, I've put away your sin. But, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. Then Nathan went to his house. <laughs> it was kind of like uh, Nathan did a mic drop or one of those, peace out, and walked off. So here's the question. Like, how, how do I understand forgiveness and the consequences of my sin? Like, we've all made mistakes. And some of you see the consequences of those mistakes every day. Because we, we wonder, like, like, if God has really forgiven me, why does he keep reminding me? That's a great question. Because in a relationship, if someone says they've forgiven you, but they keep reminding you of what you did 10 weeks, 10 years, you know, a long, long time ago, mm, they've probably not forgiven you. Like, they want you to keep feeling the pain. They want you to make sure you don't forget. They want to make... So how can God remind me? How could God kill an innocent child? Well, we know the answer to that question. Innocent people get hurt when other people screw up and do evil stuff. Like, we understand that. But, but like, if, if God's really going to forgive me, why is it the consequences keep coming? Your consequences are really a gift from God. He's, he's not reminding you of your mistake to do a little jab. It's because he loves you. He is showing you again the destruction that sin causes you. Every time God says, don't do that, it's because to do that will get you or other people hurt. And so he's reminding you, sin is ugly. There's a reason I told you not to do that. 
And when he shows you those consequences, he's also reminding you that you don't want to go back. As we were studying this week, I love how Pastor Dustin said it. He said, I often pray and say, God, give me mercy in this situation. But let me remember it enough that I never go back. Because I don't want to go back to that. The goal of God leveraging consequences in your life is to lead you to more life in Christ. Don't go back. And some of those consequences, people get hurt, you're reminded. Let it fuel you to continue to pursue the way of Jesus, not the way of the world. Let it fuel you to keep pointing people to Jesus, His perfection, not your perfection. Let it remind you, let it remind us of our need for a Savior. We've all fallen short. But God sent His Son. The gospel is, is so evident in this story. God sent Nathan to invite David home. And God restored David because of the forgiveness that would be secured through Jesus. We postponed communion once a month. We do it all together as a big family. We postponed it from last week into this weekend because of this powerful telling of the gospel. God's invitation to you to repent. I don't know where you're at. I don't know how far you've gone. But I'll tell you this. Through the outstretched arms of Jesus, God is saying, come home. Come home. And in communion, we see that Jesus gave his life. Jesus shed his blood so that we could be restored into right relationship with God. And we celebrate that when we take communion. You are invited today to worship our Lord, God's provision for our sins. You're invited to come home. Let me pray for us today. God, what a joy it is to be able to study your word and, and catch another glimpse of what life through Jesus really looks like. Thank you, O oh God, even for those heavy texts, those stories in which we look at and it, there's just kind of this heaviness, this weight. And for many of us, we begin to think about those really bad mistakes that we made. And the consequences that came because of it. Lord, we thank you that your word is as Nathan was to David. Honest. Honest about our brokenness. Honest about our need. And your word is life. Pointing us to Jesus. God, thank you that you are a just God who condemns sin. And that you're a loving God who condemned your son so that we could be saved. Because apart from him, we're lost. God, thank you for the message of the gospel and for your invitation to come home today. God, may you use us to your glory as we respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is in his name that we pray. Amen.